Claire, I need you to enable my screen sharing. Apologies, Rick, one second. I'm just gonna make you a co-host and that should take care of all of us. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else that you'd like as a co-host for the session? Um, no, I don't need anybody else. Okay. All right, hopefully you can see my slide. So this is uh, breakout 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, the topic is total versus annular versus partial solar eclipses, how they're different and why it matters. Uh, welcome everybody who's here uh, today. Appreciate your tuning in. Uh, if you meant to be in the other breakout, the one that Michael Zeiler is doing, uh, that the uh, URL for that is eclipse.aas.org slash breakout two. I won't be offended if you're in the wrong spot and you need to leave. And hopefully Michael is telling people the same thing over in his session. All right, so we're gonna, we have about a little over an hour, hour and 20 minutes or so, hour and 15 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna give uh, an introduction uh, to the topic and, and make some uh, hopefully salient points. Um, and then we will have some discussion. Um, Kate Russo, who is uh, in Australia, was going to join us uh, to share her thoughts with us. Uh, unfortunately, she has come down with COVID and is in quarantine and isolation. Thankfully, she had already prepared her presentation, so she sent me her slides. And although I am uh, not able to, to do them the same justice that she would, uh, I will at least be able to share her thoughts on this issue um, with everybody as well. All right, so here you see uh, three of my photographs of partial, annular, and total solar eclipses in that order from left to right. And we're gonna talk about uh, how they're different and what is important to keep in mind about the differences. find my cursor so that I can advance my slides. All right, there we go. Okay, so as Angela already explained, we get different types of eclipses depending on how the sun, moon, and earth are aligned. When the moon goes right in front of the sun, we have either a total solar eclipse or an annular eclipse, depending on the relative angular sizes of the sun and the moon. So again, when the moon is closer, as in the top diagram, closer than average, we get a nice total solar eclipse where the moon completely blocks the sun's bright face and lets us see the corona around it. If the moon is a little farther away in its orbit, or the, and the sun is, uh, and we're perhaps a little closer to the sun, so the sun is bigger uh, in angular size, we get an annular eclipse where the moon's shadow doesn't quite reach the earth. Um, so we see the moon blocking the central part of the disk, but leaving a bright ring of sunlight around the moon's silhouette. And then when the alignment isn't particularly good and the moon is off to one side or up or you know, above or below the sun, we get only a partial eclipse. The moon's dark inner shadow misses the earth completely and only its outer penumbral shadow touches some parts of the earth. So those are the essential physical differences between how the three different types of eclipses happen. Now, some of you may also have heard of a hybrid eclipse, or sometimes it's called an annular total eclipse. Technically, the eclipse that's occurring, uh, the total eclipse that's occurring in Australia and Indonesia next April uh, is a hybrid in the sense that although Australia and Indonesia will see a total eclipse, at the very ends of the path, the beginning and the end, uh, the moon the moon doesn't completely cover the sun. And so we have a brief annular phase at both ends of the eclipse. Um, and the reason for that is that Earth's surface is curved. And so, although we show the moon's shadow in the top diagram, for example, we show the moon's shadow touching the Earth, um, because the Earth's surface is curved, if you imagine moving up toward the North Pole or down toward the South Pole from that uh, diagram at the top, you see that you have that the moon's shadow has to reach a little farther to touch the Earth's surface. 
And when the moon's distance is just not quite enough to cover the entire sun across the whole path, you might get an annular phase at the beginning or end. I'm not gonna say much more about that. You'd have to be a fool to go to one end or the other to see an annular eclipse if the majority of the path offers a total. Um, so we're just gonna consider totals, annulars, and partials. So I saw um, a nice chat from uh, chat message from Claire in the in the plenary session where she said uh, she had never fully appreciated the, the difference between a partial and a total eclipse uh, until she saw a total. And she said a partial is like a sack of flour and a total is like uh, a loaf of bread or a cake. Uh, this quote from author Annie Dillard has always been one of my favorites. Seeing a partial eclipse bears the same relation to seeing a total eclipse as kissing someone does to getting married to that person. Um, so it's a big difference. They're two very different things. And as I mentioned, one of the uh, challenges facing the Solar Eclipse Task Force is to effectively get across to the public the message that they really should try to get into the path of totality, at least for the 2024 eclipse. So this is a graph that I created to try to make this a little more quantitative and, and explicit. This is a graph showing the change in apparent brightness during a solar eclipse, and it's plotted for a total solar eclipse. So you can see that from the beginning of an eclipse, when the moon first begins to clip the sun to the, uh, the point where totality begins, there are one, two, three, four, five and a half, or five and more than a half orders of magnitude of brightness change. That's a factor of somewhere in the neighborhood of a million. 500,000 to a million. So let's put that in context. What does that actually mean? Well, your pupils can dilate. So if you were seeing, say, a 75% partial solar eclipse, your pupils over the course of the hour or so that it takes uh, to get to 75%, uh, your pupils can dilate to compensate for the change in the, in the ambient brightness of the daylight. So you might not notice that a partial solar eclipse is happening all the way up to about 75% of a partial eclipse. That's just because of your own eyes response. Typical midday shade relative to a brightly a bright sunny day is about 85% or the equivalent of having 85% of the sun covered. Uh, so, you know, you experience plenty of days with, with shade, right? Uh, and there's nothing particularly special about it. Um, you, you will certainly notice uh, if you're seeing an 85% eclipse that it has gotten darker uh, a little bit, uh, but it's still less than, I mean, it's still uh, only a factor of tens of percent. Now on a really overcast day, like we're having today in New Hampshire, you know, it's, it's not particularly bright outside. You don't need sunglasses. Uh, it's a, just a regular overcast day. Uh, here we're at the equivalent of about you know, 93, 94%. But even then, although you would notice the change from full sun to the equivalent of an overcast day, um, it's not a particularly strange environment. Now, the annular eclipse in October of 2023 is going to cover about 95% of the sun if you're on the center line. And even that, uh, while being noticeable, uh, it's a drop from uh, full sunlight to maybe a 20th or a 30th of full sunlight, darker than an overcast day, uh, but again, uh, not particularly dramatic in terms of the um, ambient light. But in that last minute or so, that last percent of the drop in light as the moon finally fully covers the sun, the brightness fades by another factor of five to 10,000. So there is a lot of dramatic change right as you go from almost total to total. And that's why we say that the difference between a partial eclipse and a total eclipse is literally the difference between day and night. Now it doesn't get actually as dark as night, it gets dark as deep twilight, but it is still a factor of close to a million darker during totality than it was before the eclipse began. And, it all, and that most of that change happens in the last minute or so.
Now, if you're outside the path of totality, you are going to experience very little of what a total solar eclipse offers. During a total solar eclipse, you feel a dramatic temperature change. Uh, I remember in 2017, it was uh, surprising. It was more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit of a change. You will exp but outside the path, unless you're very close to the path, you probably won't notice any temperature change. You might not notice the brightness change, as I said, unless you've got at least a three quarters coverage of the sun. Um, you're not gonna see animals and birds and other creatures, uh, even people reacting very much. Uh, their behavior is not going to change much outside the path because, you know, they might not have even noticed something's happening. There's something called shadow bands where the very, very thin crescent uh, sun basically twinkles like a star and it causes ripples of uh, little bands of shadow, little dark and light uh, stripes that wiggle along the ground as that very last thin bit of solar crescent uh, is about to vanish. You won't see that unless you're right uh, unless you're within the path or you know so close to the path that you just need to take a few steps to get into it. You've heard of some phenomena like Bailey's beads and the diamond ring. Uh, Bailey's beads is when uh, the last few glimmers of sunlight are shining through the deep valleys on the edge of the moon. Uh, that's a spectacular thing to witness as those beads form and then uh, disappear one after the other until there's only one left. And when there's only one left, the sky has gotten dark enough that you can begin to see the corona. So you see this so-called diamond ring where you have um, one brilliant piece of sunlight remaining and the inner corona uh, creating a ring uh, around the silhouette of the moon. And it really does look like a diamond ring. The chromosphere, the thin layer of the sun's atmosphere between the uh, photosphere, the visible face of the sun and the corona, the outer atmosphere glows a spectacular uh, hot pink or magenta. Uh, Angela pointed those out in her talk. You don't see that unless you're in the path of totality. The corona, of course, is the main attraction, the sun's outer atmosphere. We never know exactly what it's going to look like because the sun is a dynamic, uh, ever-changing star. The corona looks different from day to day, from hour to hour. So we never know exactly what it's going to look like, although people, uh, solar physicists have gotten pretty good at predicting what it's likely to look like based on uh, the magnetic field configuration uh, leading up to the eclipse. But you won't see that unless you're in the path of totality. You won't get the beautiful twilight colors that appear on the horizon. When you're standing in a total solar eclipse, uh, the horizon outside uh, the moon's shadow, that is the, in looking in all directions out toward where the eclipse isn't total, uh, you're effectively looking at what looks like a sunset or a sunrise in every direction. You get these beautiful pastel oranges, yellows, pinks, apricots. Uh, again, it has to be totality for you to see that. And you won't see stars or planets appearing during the middle of the day unless you are in the path of totality. So this is my way of saying that a 99% eclipse is not 99% of the experience of a total eclipse. Uh, it's more like 1%. You really don't get uh, the gist of why total solar eclipses are so cool if you don't actually get into the path. So this is that cartoon again that, uh, that Angela showed, but I like to point out to people that although a total eclipse is off the charts, it's only off the charts if you are within the path. Um, and in Claire's presentation, I'll show you some examples where people clearly were not inside the path when they formed an opinion of how exciting a total solar eclipse is. So one of our tasks that we've set for ourselves is to convince as many people as possible to get into the path of totality in 2024. Rachel, this is a map. On, before you move on, we actually have a question in the chat that I think oh, is relevant you. to your last slide. Mm -hmm. um, so Rachel asks, uh, as mentioned in the plenary session chat, those of us in the greater Toronto area will see a 99.9% .9 eclipse. Does that 0.9% mm. eclipse make a difference or is it on a par with a 99% eclipse? Well, 99.9% .9 is pretty far down on this graph. Uh, you will definitely not see the solar corona, uh, but you will experience many of the other phenomena. 
um, it's still going to be a hundred times brighter than if it were a total eclipse. So I don't think stars and planets are going to come out. I'm not sure you're going to see the sunset colors. I'm pretty sure you won't. Um, you might see uh, some Bailey's beads um, and you might see uh, some chromosphere, uh, but you will not see the corona. So, I mean, if you're at 99.9%, .9%, it's worth taking a short bicycle ride <laughs> or a jog into the path. Even if you only get uh, 30 seconds of totality, it'll blow your mind. It's worth the effort. So here's a map of the 2017 eclipse that NASA distributed um, back uh, in the run-up to that eclipse. And it shows uh, what the eclipse looks like on and off the path, but it doesn't give a particularly good sense that being in the path is dramatically different than being off the path. Um, you'll notice that off the path, you get these crescents uh, in the path, it, it almost shows you a picture of what looks like an annular eclipse. I would have liked to see something more like this saying, hey, if you wanna see the real phenomenon of a total solar eclipse, which is way more dramatic than anything you can see off the path, you really have to get uh, into the path and you're gonna see something spectacular like this. And then maybe even gussy it up with some additional indicators that the closer you are to the path, the happier you'll be, but unless you're right in the middle of the path, you won't be completely happy. So we're gonna try really hard to get that message across more effectively for 2024. All right, so at this point, I was gonna turn it over to Kate Russo. Uh, she lives in Australia. She's a, psych a professional psychologist. Uh, she also happens to be an eclipse chaser. Uh, and putting those two things together um, turned her into a book author. Um, as I said, she has unfortunately come down with a serious case of COVID, so she's unable to join us right now. She has a few posters and is hoping to be able to tune in to one or both of the poster sessions uh, at the end of the, each of these two days. Um, but uh, she has sent me her slides, and so I'll, I'll present those in a moment. Uh, the two books she wrote, the first one, Total Addiction, was a psychologist's attempt to figure out what it is that drives people to chase solar eclipses. Now, she had some innate feeling for that because she herself was already an eclipse chaser, but she interviewed a lot of people who travel the world to see every total solar eclipse that, that occurs uh, to try to get into their heads and really understand their motivations. And then uh, she wrote another book uh, in which she interviewed people about their first experience. And this became possible when she started traveling uh, outside of Australia to see eclipses in other places and made it a point to do interviews with people who were seeing their first eclipse. So I'm gonna stop um, sharing for a moment and then open her PowerPoint. Um, so just give me a second here. I'm going to stop altogether so that I can find her presentation. And now I'm going to share again. All right, I'm having trouble sharing. Uh, let me see. You want to send it over to me? I can try and share it as a backup. Uh, let me, my share window, I'm closing my share window altogether. I'm going to try it again. Okay. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It just didn't like me trying to do too many things at once. So can you see her title slide? Yep, sounds good. Okay, That's great. Good. Okay, so uh, although my voice isn't as nice as Kate's, um, I hope that I can do her justice or at least come close to it. So again, her, her website is beinginthashadow.com um, and you should go there uh, to find out more about her books and about her research. Okay, so she wants to talk about what to expect when you're expecting an eclipse. So as I've tried to convey, totality is a unique and awe-inspiring event. Um, Kate has a beautiful way of describing it. She says, totality occurs above you, around you, and within you. Above you is what you see in the sky. It's the only time you can see the solar corona, 
and then uh, the phenomena that immediately precede it and follow it, the diamond rings, the chromosphere, Bailey's beads, and solar prominences, which I didn't mention, but those are when um, little uh, explosions of gas off of the limb of the sun uh, are visible. These come from the, from the chromosphere and they're that bright hot pink or magenta uh, that you can see around the edges of the sun during many eclipses. Around you are those horizon effects I mentioned. Uh, you feel the temperature drop. You see the, the light go from bright daylight to, to uh, dusk or dawn. And you see the beautiful pastel sunset colors around the horizon. And then within you are the emotions that occur. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to start crying. You hear a lot of shouting. Uh, people are euphoric. They're also feeling different things. They're feeling connected to the other people who are experiencing the eclipse with them. Sometimes they feel a sense of insignificance because this magnificent thing is happening in the sky as the celestial bodies rendezvous, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. There's nothing we can do to speed it up. And there's nothing we can make it do um, that it doesn't want to do all by itself. So it's happening above you, around you, and within you. And of course, as a psychologist, uh, Kate is particularly, particularly keen to, to understand what it is that happens within us during these events. Now, she's concerned, as, as uh, I am too, especially uh, since I've spent most of my career in science communication, uh, we worry about overhyping the eclipse. Now, the definition of overhype is to make exaggerated claims about an event, to publicize or promote something excessively. And there, well, let me not get ahead of her slides. Here's a case where um, an Idaho man fell victim to eclipse overhype uh, back in 2017. Uh, he thought that uh, this was gonna be, you know, the, the greatest thing in the world. And he uh, spent $20,000 uh, to put an event together for a small crowd, uh, but the, uh, the event didn't live up to the, the hype that, uh, that uh, he ex that he um, swallowed in the in the weeks and months beforehand. Well, it's clear that although he was in Idaho and the total eclipse did pass over Idaho, uh, his little event for a small crowd was not in the path of totality, but outside. And so everything that he was being told about how great a total eclipse was uh, didn't come to pass because he was not in the path. He was close to it, but not in it. And here's an editorial from somebody the day after the eclipse saying, uh, again, it was overhyped. Um, well, it turns out uh, she was viewing from well outside the path and saw only a partial eclipse. So uh, here's this quote that says, you know, as long as I can remember, people have been pushing these once in a lifetime space events down my throat. They're underwhelming and far too frequent. Think the eclipse is any different? You're wrong. Well, you wouldn't say that if you had seen a total eclipse. Other things that are overhyped, um, well, I'll get to them in a second. So Kate's point, and I would agree with it 100%, is that the total solar eclipse is worthy of the hype, but only if you're in the path of totality. Outside the path, you have only a partial eclipse. It's not an event worth hyping. It's important to remember that for any total solar eclipse, most people are going to be viewing from outside the path. Um, in 2017, about 20 million people observed the total solar eclipse. A little over half of them lived in the path already, and about the other half, or, or the other not quite half, traveled into the path. But that's 20 million people out of more than 300 million people in the country. So most people, by far, did not experience the total eclipse. And so we have to manage expectations for everybody, and most of everybody will not be in the path. So it's important not to overhype the eclipse without being very clear of the difference between the partial and the total eclipse. As she says, overhyping creates a large gap between expectations and reality, and that gap is bridged by serious disappointment. So the, we are living in an age of overhype. Uh, the supermoon that uh, Angela mentioned earlier 
that that's not an astronomical term that was actually come up with by an astrologer and now uh, the supermoon is touted every time one happens every time the moon is full when it's at the nearest point of its orbit this is not a rare event angela said it happens typically once a year it often happens two or three times two or three months in a row um, because the moon's orbit is constantly uh rotating with respect to the stars, uh, but it, it doesn't rotate very quickly. So if you get a super moon one month, you're likely to get a super moon the next, and then eventually uh, the full moon will happen at a different part of the moon's orbit. Other things that are overhyped, one of the ones that I think is uh, uh, most seriously overhyped are meteor showers. Uh, even the best meteor shower from a dark location will only have you know one or two meteors per minute. Um, that's not uh, you know, that doesn't sound like a shower. That doesn't even sound like a drizzle. Um, the only kind of event that would be worth hyping related to meteors would be a meteor storm. And those are very rare and largely unpredictable. So it's important not to overhype uh, these experiences. And I would, I would argue that the science press doesn't overhype these events to the extent that they uh, encourage people to go out and look for a meteor shower or go out and look uh, at a total solar eclipse, they're very clear to say, you need to be in the path. You need to be at a dark site for a meteor shower. Uh, it needs to be completely clear. You need to allow yourself time to get used to the dark and all these kind of caveats. But the popular press is really bad about this. And I know this from personal experience because as press officer of the American Astronomical Society, I was routinely interviewed about upcoming celestial events. I was always clear about what people could expect to see or not see and what the caveats were. And then inevitably, when the article appeared, all of those caveats were missing and it was just get out there and see it. It's going to be the greatest thing in the world. And then, of course, people are disappointed. So here are some suggestions from Kate. Uh, try to curtail any media overhype you encounter, especially related to uh, Eclipse Armageddon, that sense that uh, it's, it's like the end of the world and we're going to have, um, you know, the worst traffic jams in history. Well, we did actually in 2017, but we're hoping to avoid that in 2024. But instead, focus on the ongoing planning for uh, the fact that, you know, thousands or millions of people are going to move into the path and we need to get ready for them. And they're going to have a really great experience. Try to educate people about what to expect both inside and outside the path without minimizing the experience of people who won't be in the path. Inside the path, yes, it will live up to the hype. Uh, I should add, as long as the sky is clear. Um, although even people who got clouded out at their first eclipse uh, get pretty excited because of all the other things that happen. The cold, uh, you know, the temperature drop, uh, the darkness, the strange behavior of animals, even if they don't see the corona. Outside the path, a partial eclipse is, you know, it's worth looking at if you have um, safe filters or know how to do it uh, via projection. Uh, but and it can be enjoyable, but it's not a big deal, and um, you'll get you'll get many more chances to see partial eclipses than you will to see a total. She recommends that all of us who are involved in promoting the upcoming eclipses be proactive with the media, so that they're less likely to overhype the total eclipse or even the annular in their own coverage. And be aware that messaging that only focuses on get into the path of totality is not very helpful for towns and communities that are not located in the path. Uh, you cannot move a town, <laughs> you can only move people out of it or into it. Uh, so while our, um, I've emphasized that the Solar Eclipse Task Force really wants to encourage people to get into the path, uh, especially for the total eclipse in April, 2024, but uh, we do need to be mindful that not everyone will be able to do so. So we need to make it very clear to them what they will and will not experience. All right. So again, totality is an awe-inspiring event that happens above you, around you, and within you. And the, to the extent that we can get that message across to people, it will help them uh, be motivated to get into the path. What about an annular eclipse? She characterizes it as an intense event that leaves you wanting more. Um, you get um, a lot of the excitement of a total eclipse because the moon moves right onto the face of the sun. 
but it still doesn't get any darker than uh, overcast day. And you don't get an opportunity to see the corona or the sunset colors or the stars coming out. But it's still a lot of fun. So she says the annular eclipse happens above you and around you, but not likely within you because the emotion just isn't there. You don't get that factor of 10,000 drop in the last minute. A partial eclipse, partial solar eclipse is an interesting event to observe, but it only happens above you. You don't get much in the way of environmental changes and it certainly isn't an emotional thrill. So Kate's been working on how to manage people's expectations. And just like you're seeing all of these uh, two-dimensional uh, arrays of, of things that uh, can help you rate something, for example, how likely is an asteroid to hit the earth uh, or um, how likely is, uh, you know, is uh, some uh, mechanical device to fail over some period of time. Uh, so you, uh, here she's come up with this guide to eclipse expectations. She has total, total eclipse on the left, annular eclipse, and then a deep partial and just a more ordinary partial where she draws the line at roughly that three quarters of coverage which is where I said uh, it becomes pretty easy to notice that the environment is changing. Uh, the sky is getting no noticeably darker. So on emotional impact, she lists a total solar eclipse as 100, but an annular is down around five and a deep partial or a partial is you know, two to nothing. Changes in the environment is one of the main reasons. You've got 100 for a total solar eclipse and on a scale of, zero, of one to 100 or zero to 100, you know, an annular is about eight, a deep partial is maybe seven, um, and then uh, just an ordinary partial is not worth really commenting on. Um, I should mention that, that these numbers are consistent with my feeling that an annular eclipse is more like a special case of a partial eclipse than it is like a special case of a central eclipse of the sun. Um, if the central eclipse doesn't completely cover the sun, uh, the bright face of the sun and give you totality. Um, it's really like just a, still, it's just a partial. It's just that now instead of a crescent, you've got a ring. Mm -hmm. Life impact, again, on a scale of zero to hundred, total hundred, uh, the annular and the partial are not particularly impactful. Um, and the overall intensity rating, uh, sorry, it says uh, divided by 10. I think what she meant is uh, on a scale of zero to 10, but she's, we're using a scale of zero to hundred here. Uh, again, uh, an annular or deep partial eclipse is, you know, definitely worth seeing, but uh, nothing much to write home about uh, compared to a total. So this is uh, a way of sort of, you know, quantifying as best you can uh, the emotional and environmental uh, impacts of the different types of eclipses. And clearly, a total solar eclipse stands above all others. So... She has some discussion points that we can talk about when, when I'm finished with the presentation. Uh, she's curious if, if you like her subjective table and if, she if you think there might be some other categories worth adding to it uh, to rate total versus other kinds of eclipses. What about the experience of people who observe from the edge? Uh, there's been a debate in the eclipse chasing community for some years um, about whether it's better to observe a total solar eclipse from the center line where you maximize the duration of totality or from the edge. Um, the edge gives you the least amount of time in totality, but it augments the experience of some of the other phenomena. For example, uh, Bailey's beads and the chromosphere uh, and prominences can be visible for much longer when you're observing from the edge, because think about it, the moon is moving across the sun rather than directly into it from the edge. You know, it's, it's, it's just skirting the edge of the sun. So, uh, certain phenomena of a total solar eclipse are actually better seen from the edge than from the middle. And she references this article that appeared recently in uh, the Astrophysical Journal Supplement Series. Uh, that journal is now fully open access, so you can get a free copy of this uh, article by, read, uh, by going to the Astrophysical Journal Supplement Series website, which you can find uh, from the AAS website, AAS.org, not eclipse.AAS.org but the main AAS site. Um, and uh, 
so th this goes to that question of 99.9%. Um, if you take that short walk from 99.9 .9 to, to right at 100, uh, it'll be worth the effort. And you will have some phenomena that you see better than if you had gone even deeper into the path. But what I always like to say is if it's your first eclipse, especially, or if you've, maybe even if you've, if you've seen one or two before, but it's still a pretty, uh, pretty new to you, try to get as close to the center line as you ca can, because the corona is by far the most spectacular thing to see during an eclipse. And the longer you have to view it, the better, because no matter how long an eclipse actually lasts, it always seems to be over only seconds after it began. And then she has several posters that you can find in Gather uh, where she explores this question of being on the edge or just off the edge or not quite in the path uh, and how, uh, how she's working to prepare uh, communities that are not quite in the path uh, for the experience that they'll have without making them feel uh, like they're uh, missing out on too much. All right, so now I'm gonna stop sharing again and go back to my slides. We're getting near the end, so don't panic. Well, can we maybe pause and just see if folks have questions? Um, sure. You can unmute yourself and speak up uh, or you can put them in the chat. I haven't seen any specific questions. There has been some good discussion though. Great. Okay. This is Wayne Wooten. Uh, in May 30th, 1984, we had a very unusual case of broken annularity uh, in central Alabama up until Atlanta and so forth. And of course, that was almost a spectacular. I've seen two totalities, but uh, judging the crowd reaction, a broken annularity when you have Bailey speeds all around and it gets, it gets uh, dark enough that you can see the bright planets. Uh, it's, but, but that's, of course, an extremely rare hybrid, uh, and I don't know if anything like it's going to be occurring uh, probably again in my lifetime, but a broken antler is really cool if you'd ever get a chance to see one of those. Yeah, I suppose um, if you were to go to the April 2023 total solar eclipse and um, get yourself out in the ocean near the crossover point where it goes from annular to total, uh, you could get that broken annular. Um, but I think it's extremely remote places in the ocean, you know, right at the beginning and right at the end of the path. Yeah. Uh, so I doubt people are going to do that when they can get a minute or so of totality by going to Australia or Indonesia. Uh, nevertheless, um, it will happen in your lifetime. Uh, it's just a question of whether you want to go to the remote ocean to see it. All right, so let me see if I can get this uh, PowerPoint going again. All right. Well, uh, we have another hand up. Jay Miller has his hand up. Okay. Yeah, I just the just point there, you talked about going to the edge. Uh, there are these crazy people who purposely go to the edge and that what they're trying to do is seeing whether there are changes in the diameter of the sun over the, uh, the sunspot cycle. And supposedly there is a very slight change, maybe a 10th of a percent, but you need more data. And yes, I've in fact, that. That, that paper that, uh, that Kate referenced is exactly about that. It's from a team that went to the edge uh, to try to measure the diameter of the sun with great precision. Obviously, yep. um, the, where the edge is, is determined by the diameter of the sun, the diameter of the moon, and the distance between them and the earth. Um, and if you have the diameter of the sun wrong, then where you think the edge of the shadow will be, of the moon's shadow will be, will be wrong. So if you go to the edge and do very careful measurements as to exactly, you know, how close you are to the to the real edge uh, of the shadow, uh, you can actually work backwards and, and figure out the, um, the actual diameter of the sun, if you know the other quantities, which we know better. We know the diameter of the moon very accurately, and we know the distances very accurately between the three bodies. So the only, the only uncertainty is in the diameter of the sun. And there is 
um, some disagreement right now uh, over exactly what the diameter of the sun is, uh, whether it's increasing, decreasing, or fluctuating. Um, so that was what that paper was about. Are there any other questions or should I go ahead and start up again? I think you can go ahead. Okay. So one thing I wanted to mention um, is that Kate has written, in addition to these two books, she's written a um, guide to solar eclipse planning for communities. Uh, this is a second edition of a guide that she created for uh, the 20, well, actually in 2015 for the eclipse in the Faroe Islands. Um, this version, she now has uh, one for Australia for next year, um, and this one for the US, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, it's considerably expanded and incorporates a lot of her uh, additional insights from more recent eclipses, and it's available for download on the downloads page in our resources section on the eclipse.aas.org website. Okay, so the only topic I really want to deal with now is um, solar eclipse safety and how it's different or what you need to keep in mind for partials, annulars, and total solar eclipses. So here's a composite from 2017 showing the entire eclipse. Uh, the time goes like this. Uh, so it starts in the upper right as you see the moon just beginning to encroach on the sun. And then you've got uh, the partial phases that give rise eventually to the diamond ring and the chromosphere and the corona. And then the moon begins to move off the sun and it ends on the lower row going from left to right. Well, it's important to know that the partial phase uh, leading up to the total eclipse lasts more than an hour. The excitement of the diamond ring uh, giving way to the corona takes literally just seconds. The corona itself is visible typically for minutes. In April of 2024, we're gonna have um, almost four and a half minutes at the longest point. And even up in, uh, in New England, it'll still be longer than three minutes, which is more than the 2017 eclipse. And then it changes rapidly coming out of totality and then takes another hour plus uh, to go through the partial phases. Now, the reason I am pointing this out is to drive home the point that when you're going to have a total eclipse, you're going to have totality for a few minutes, but you're going to have a partial eclipse before and after that lasts longer than an hour. The whole event lasts something of order two and a half to three hours. And there are different safety considerations for partials and totals. And so that's what we need to start thinking about. A total solar eclipse is about as bright as the full moon. And there's no reason why you can't look at it directly with your eyes. You can even look at a total solar eclipse without any protection through binoculars and a telescope, but only during the total phase. During the partial phases leading up to it and coming out of it, you need to use some kind of filter. Now there are indirect ways of observing the sun, but if you wanna look at the sun, you need to use a solar filter. And ever since 2015, there has been an international standard for what is a safe solar filter. And it's one that meets the requirements of this ISO 12312-2 international standard. It blocks about a hundred thousandth, all but one one hundred thousandth of the sun's visible light and infrared light and blocks uh, all but a few percent of the sun's ultraviolet light creating a completely safe way to look at the sun. But if your filter does not meet that ISO standard, you can't be sure that it's truly safe. What about an annular? An annular eclipse, just like a total eclipse, begins with a partial and ends with a partial. The difference is that during the annular phase, you still need to use a filter. So throughout an annular eclipse, and by definition, throughout a partial eclipse, if you're not even having an annual, you must use a filter to look directly at the sun. And again, that filter must comply with the ISO 12312-2 standard. 
Now, we want to urge people to get their eclipse glasses early, not to get them on Amazon. In 2017, solar viewers uh, manufactured in the US and demonstrated through testing at an accredited lab to meet the ISO standard sold out a few weeks before the eclipse. And Amazon jumped in with a bunch of Chinese made eclipse glasses whose ISO certification was either faked or otherwise in doubt. People were buying their filters on Amazon. And then when it became clear that they were not known for sure to be safe, they had to discard them. And that caused a lot of people to not observe the eclipse. This was, of course, a bigger problem outside the path than inside, because inside the path, they at least had a few minutes of totality where they could look directly at the sun. So where do you go if you don't go to Amazon? Go back to our website, eclipse.aas.org, and look in the eye safety section. Um, this is a section where we are going to do what we did back in 2017. Uh, we're starting the process now. We're going to list all the vendors who we have verified through our own examination of their documentation that they have proven their solar glasses and other filters to be safe. So if you find a supplier listed on our website, you know for sure that they're safe. If you don't find them on our website, it doesn't mean they're not safe because it could just mean that we haven't had an opportunity to check. Um, but that's your best bet. And the earlier you can get filters, the better, because you don't want to risk running out or not being able to get them because the supplies have run out. Now, this is one reason why the 2023 eclipse is a boon for the 2024 eclipse. People will be trying to get solar filters because they absolutely have to have them for the annular in 2023 before October of 2023, which means most people hopefully will have their glasses by then and there won't be a mad rush in 2024. But I'm probably fooling myself and there will probably be a mad rush in 2024 anyway. Now, of course, you also need filters for your optics if you're gonna look through binoculars or look through a telescope or try to take pictures through a camera lens. Uh, we have suppliers of um, filters for optics on our website as well. If you do filter your optics, you need to make sure that the filter can't be dislodged uh, by wind or by curious toddler's fingers. Uh, and if you have a finder scope of any sort on your telescope, you need to make sure that you either filter it too or cover it with tape or something because you don't want anybody looking through your finder uh, if it's not filtered. Uh, there are two main types of filters, the glass ones and the aluminized polyester. Um, most amateur astronomers will have a solar filter for the telescope. So, in some ways, Wait. yeah, go Wait, ahead, can, I, can I interrupt you for one second? So mm -hmm. Spencer um, made a comment in the chat to say that uh, they bought a thousand sets eight months after 2017. And I have a, a question for you. So on some Eclipse glasses that I had mm -hmm. left over after 2017, they have an expiration date. And I wonder if you have any insight into the how long the, the film lasts and whether or not we're safely able to use 2017 glasses for 2023 or 24. Thank you, that's a really good question. The short answer is if you've got any kind of filters or glasses in 2017, they're still perfectly fine. Uh, as long as they're not torn, punctured, um, the film isn't coming loose from the holder or anything like that. It has been admitted to me by solar filter manufacturers um, that although in the old days when these Eclipse glasses first began being produced, uh, the films did have a finite lifetime. With modern materials that have been available certainly th since the beginning of the 21st century, um, the films essentially last forever as long as they're stored in, you know, in a good place and they're not damaged in any way. But the reason that, they, that some manufacturers still print the expiration date, well, there's two reasons. One is that, uh, and this is the one they've admitted to me, uh, they want to sell more filters so they don't, they don't want you to you know, to buy a filter and save it for the rest of your life. Uh, that's the crass commercial reason. The other reason is that the ISO standard actually says that you should print an expiration date on your filters. 
Um, now, there, uh, there was a study conducted by Ralph Chu, who's the biggest name in solar filter safety and the author of the ISO standard, and a colleague of his in Australia, Stephen Dane, and Lil Omi. Uh, we evaluated solar filters uh, a few years ago after the 2017 eclipse and determined uh, that uh, the ISO standard could stand a couple of tweaks, one of which is uh, that the expiration date should be um, expunged from the standard because uh, it's really no longer relevant uh, to filters that are manufactured, you know, currently or even recently. So just make sure that you inspect your filters before you use them. And as long as they're uh, in pristine condition, they're perfectly safe to use again. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else or should I go forward? No, I think you can go forward. Thank you. Okay, so I came up with a safe viewing plan um, that I recommend to people who are observing a total eclipse for the first time and who don't have a lot of experience um, because they're just like the question about 99.9% .9 versus 100. The question is, when is it really safe to take your filters off? And when is it, when must you put them back on? And so I came up with a plan that I consider to be foolproof as long as you follow it uh, to protect your eyes and not risk uh, hurting yourself for a total eclipse. And here's how it works. It's got two parts. The first part is the beginning partial phases and the beginning of totality. And my recommendation is, oh, I have to make sure my cursor's in there. Oops. Is to keep your glasses, your eclipse glasses or other solar filters on until you can't see anything through them and then take them off to marvel at the totally eclipsed sun, including the corona. Now it's true that if you do this, you will miss the first diamond ring but you will get to see the thin solar crescent break up and you will see Bailey's beads and you will not be dazzled with bright sunlight right before totality, which would cause you to miss the faint outer parts of the coronal streamers. I noticed in the chat, I think it was Vivian White who mentioned uh, some observers will wear an eye patch over one eye so that they can be dark adapted uh, and be able to see uh, the faint outer coronal streamers. Um, that is a, a, a reasonable thing to try. Um, it's a good idea to practice that beforehand though, to see if it's comfortable for you. I've tried it and I don't like observing a total eclipse with two eyes that are uh, not equally sensitive. It just, it, it confuses my brain. Um, and and I, so I, I don't use that eye patch technique, but there are others who don't find that a problem. Uh, and it's a great way a uh, great way to observe. So if you're not going to do the, do the eye patch thing, that's fine. But mainly, uh, this is again with a with a view toward eye safety. If you keep your eclipse glasses or filters on until it's until you can't see anything through them, when you finally take them off, you will be looking at the corona and you will not have risked hurting yourself. Now, what about at the end? At the end, you know, it's okay to glimpse the diamond ring briefly. Uh, that's why you know, people start screaming excitedly when they see it. So at the end of totality, you'll have a warning, right? You'll know uh, that the diamond ring is happening. The, the colorful chromosphere will appear uh, and then you'll get this bright bead and you'll see the diamond ring and very quickly it becomes too bright. So you'll, you'll, you'll wanna look away, but you will have gotten to see the second diamond ring. And then as soon as it becomes uncomfortably bright, you put your filters back on. So I'm talking here about naked eye observing, of course. Uh, you must not be looking through binoculars or a telescope at totality and then continue to watch without a filter when the diamond ring appears, because even that brief single point of brilliant sunlight through binoculars or a telescope will burn your retina. All right, so that's it for my presentation. So now we have uh, the rest of the time available for uh, additional comments and questions. And at this point, I guess I can start to uh, look at the uh, the chat myself because I don't have to look at my slides, um, but I don't well, there, see- There was hand. one follow-up question from Rachel regarding the expiration date of, of Eclipse filters. Um, okay. And she wonders if it would be a potential liability for an organization if you're giving out expired Eclipse classes. 
Um, well, that's an interesting point. There's always liability questions, right? We live in a contentious society, a litigious society. Um, I'm not sure that uh, most, I don't think most Eclipse glasses actually have their manufacturing date on them. They'll say uh, discard after three years, but, they, um, but I'm not sure you'll know for sure when they were actually manufactured. Um, I think some manufacturers are probably going to continue to want to put that expiration notice on it for whatever reason, whether it's for, you know, uh, because they want to make more money or just because they're worried about liability. Um, I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a much more of an answer to it than that. I mean, if somebody wants to sue you, they will. Uh, there were some lawsuits after the 2017 eclipse, um, Many of them were against Amazon for selling questionably safe or unsafe filters. Um, none of those lawsuits went to trial as far as I'm aware. Uh, I believe that they were all settled by Amazon because Amazon can afford to settle whatever the heck it wants. All right. Yeah. Are there Rachel, any does that answer your question? There? I think at this point, if anybody has questions, um, you know, please feel free to raise your hand and unmute and ask your question orally. Um, I think this is a good time for discussion. We have, I think, about 20 minutes left before the end of the session. Just let me check the schedule. Uh, we are due to wrap up at um, yeah, 2 10 Eastern. So, yeah, about half an hour. Or so. That's great. I want uh, to yeah. just call Where attention is the right hand. Where is the right hand? Oh, um, under reactions. So at the bottom of the window, you should be able to click that and play and, and there's a raise hand button. Or if, if that doesn't work for you, you can you can just unmute and ask or put it in the chat to say that you have a question. Hey, Claire, this is Don oh. at St. Louis. Hi. Hey there. So one of the things that we made very clear last time was you can't just be the ISO is correct on the glasses. You need to follow the chain of the purchase so you know it came from a legitimate source and not just look at the number. We found fake glasses with the correct numbers, but the, the chain was just wrong. So it's very important to follow that purchase trail. Yes, and that's why we, uh, we started a list of reputable vendors on our website because um, we had checked, we had done that. We'd followed the paper trail. Um, and you can't even look at the paper trail uh, you can't just accept that the paper trail is legitimate. Uh, it turned out that uh, several Chinese manufacturers were submitting uh, other companies' test results that they had doctored uh, to change the name of the company. So it really was a, um, a nasty situation. Um, so we, we tried to do that work for you. Again, if you go to that, if you go to our website today and, and look at that list, it, it, right now it only has manufacturers listed. I haven't listed any dealers yet. Um, I am working with the manufacturers to find out who their authorized dealers are now. Um, I can't trust that the, that the dealers from 2017 are the same as now. Uh, so over the next few weeks, I'm going to re be rebuilding that list. Um, and I already have begun to, uh, to compile it. So you'll start to see more and more names on that list in the next few weeks. So, so Rick, what I'm saying, though, is that we found exact duplications of authorized glasses. I mean, they were making them perfect, except that you can literally hold them up to the light and see light coming through just a regular light. So it's got to be the trail. you got to follow that actual trail. Yeah, you have to know where they came from. Exactly. Right. right. And, and now if you, which means that's why you can't buy them on Amazon or you shouldn't buy them on Amazon. Now, if you go to a, uh, if you go to a planetarium or a science museum or you go to an event sponsored by a university astronomy department or by an amateur astronomy club or any astronomical association, you're very likely, I mean, you, you can pretty well trust that they have uh, taken the trouble to make sure that the glasses that they're distributing are safe. Uh, but if you buy them at a country, you know, a general store, or um, if you buy them, um, if you're just given them by a friend uh, or you find them um, on Amazon or Walmart or something like that, uh, you can't be sure uh, unless you've checked our list and seen that we've confirmed that the stuff at this or that uh, store is, you know, has been purchased from a legitimate manufacturer. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a few hands raised now. So Wayne, uh, I think you were up first. What's your question? Uh, well, uh, how do we keep them entertained if it's just the partial eclipse? We have a lot of sunspots out now. I was observing right before I uh, uh, came on. And undoubtedly, we're going to have a good bit of stuff happening in 2023 and 2024. What we did in 2017 to add interest was we had a lottery. There was a really good spot almost in the center. And we had people write down their predictions of exactly when the lunar disk would cover that spot. And then we, award, uh, we awarded a lemon meringue pie to the winner. <laughs> And that gave everybody a sense of the moon's motion as you were seeing it moving its own diameter eastward every hour as it orbited the earth. You could actually see it approaching that. And so we only got about like 80% coverage in Pensacola, but uh, it, it, was quite, it was quite good. And that's something that practically everybody in the United States can avail themselves of is, uh, Let's, uh, you know, publish the day ahead of time. Okay, uh, this is where the sunspots were and realize the sun's going to rotate a little bit between today and the day of totality. But uh, have people uh, just make a guess uh, and you'll undoubtedly have, you know, 40 or 50 people and maybe two or three of them will be splitting the pie in the end. We'll see. But uh, that's a good thing to do. Another thing about uh, the end of totality uh, in 1991, I was with the Kansas City group uh, as south of Mazatlan, and we had designated counters that were giving us the last 10 seconds of totality. And of course, they were clearly saying, okay, get your cameras ready, shoot the diamond ring, but look away, look away, no more. Get your eclipse glasses right back up now. Do not observe anything else naked eye. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good safety precaution if you have any club or planetarium or group observing is do have a designated person who is going to be your safety officer, who is going to give you a warning at the end of totality about how dangerous it would, particularly if you're looking through the telescope, it's okay to go ahead and burn up your, you're not going to burn up your smartphone, but you know, don't be looking through the eyepiece. If you want to capture the diamond ring, on your smartphone or photography, great, but don't be observing that critical last stage there. Uh, and you'll come up with some beautiful photos and everybody will still have their eyesight safe. There's even an app, you know, there's an app for that. Um, there's an app called Solar Eclipse Timer. Uh, so that even if you're observing all by yourself and you don't have anybody to appoint as your safety officer, it talks to you and it will, uh, it knows where you are uh, so it, it computes the exact eclipse circumstances for, for where you're observing from, and it tells you what's coming next and when totality will end. Uh, and so it's a great tool, and you can find a link to that. Um, I'm not sure it's there yet. I think it is a link to that on our, uh, in our resources section on the apps and software page. That's a great idea. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, George, I think you're up next for your question. Uh, this is George in Parish, Texas. When uh, when we were advising the city about selecting location for people to come in and see our four minutes of totality, uh, we don't really have much of a place that doesn't have a street light around. Uh, have other cities had any luck with getting people to touch street lights? Uh, you're like talking things. about like getting getting the towns to turn off their or make sure the street lights don't come on during totality. Um, I I have heard uh, of people doing that. I mean that's one of the things that's uh, part of the community planning process. Is uh, um, you know if you're going to observe from say a golf course or some field or a park uh, that has lights that come on at dusk, uh, you definitely want to arrange with the um, responsible officials to, uh, to disable that for the eclipse. Um, and, uh, but yeah, somebody has to find out who's the right person to ask and make sure that they, that they do ask. Uh, it won't happen by itself. 
there have been um, plenty of instances uh, where astronomers, for example, amateur astronomers have uh, gotten permission to observe an event uh, from a park uh, only to have sprinklers come on automatically uh, or uh, you know, to have street lights come on automatically uh, at the worst possible time. Yeah, that's definitely a concerted effort. Uh, Vivian in the chat asks, uh, were there any verified eyes damaged in 2017? Yes, but it was a mercifully small number. Uh, we collaborated with a bunch of um, optometric and ophthalmic professional societies uh, who canvassed their members to find out uh, how many had treated eye injuries after the eclipse. And the out of the thousands and thousands of responses that they got back, uh, the total number of incidents was about 50. Uh, now we don't know if you extrapolate, you know, to including all the people who didn't respond, but, but it clearly was a very small number. Um, and almost all of the injuries were uh, minor and temporary. I'm unaware of anybody uh, who even went temporarily blind. There were just uh, some you know, retinal damage, uh, temporary retinal damage that healed itself. Um, the, uh, in contrary to what a lot of people think, um, and even though I use the phrase retinal burn, um, it, it takes a lot of sunlight to, to actually burn your retinal cells and make them blind forever. Uh, the, the, a typical short exposure to bright sunlight um, will produce chemical changes that will give you a blind spot, but it's usually resolves itself within hours to days. So um, this is for naked eye viewing. Even a very slight glimpse through a telescope at, at, a bright, at the bright sun, there is enough concentrated sunlight there to thermally, you know, to heat the retina and destroy cells. And that you can't recover from. But to my knowledge, there were no such injuries in 2017. I'm sure given our contacts with the medical community that we would have heard if there had been. So in that sense, we feel like our safety messaging was on target and produced the desired results. Okay. Tom Vasso said, so maybe you are next with your hand up. Yes. Uh, one of the things we're going to show in preparation before the eclipse happens at our meeting uh, for the attendees is to show them the view of the sky, uh, like a, a solarium screen capture or something, so that they know where they could find the planets. Mm -hmm. So is Mars going to be out, Venus, whatever. Uh, it, it, for the people that are doing the prep work for things that might be helpful to people across the country. Has anyone thought about maybe doing some screen captures? I realize that view changes depending on where you are, but yeah. even if there was a few different sample options of West Coast, Central, East Coast or something, it's probably close enough that anyone doing any event can show one of the, those versions so right. we know whether we're gonna see Venus and, and Jupiter or not. Just wanted to throw that out there in case anyone has done that or thought about it. Yeah, I've definitely thought about it. I haven't done it yet. Um, I did create uh, such a diagram for New Hampshire because I met with uh, the New Hampshire Travel Council recently. Um, and also we have uh, an attendee at this workshop, Rick Eames, who's up here with me in New Hampshire. Uh, he's actually uh, taken that illustration that I created using, um, I think I used Sky Safari. Um, and uh, made a wrap for his, um, for his jet black Dodge Challenger, uh, which he's now christened the Eclipse Mobile. Uh, and he's going to be driving that around, uh, showing people what the Eclipse will be like and what they can see during totality. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to end up putting some diagrams like that on our website. Uh, there's um, a program from, uh, from Xavier Jubier, who some of you will know, uh, he does some really spectacular eclipse mapping, and he was a co-author on that paper about measuring the diameter of the sun. Um, he's written uh, two programs, one called Solar Eclipse Maestro and another called Lunar Eclipse Maestro that can automate photography of eclipses. 
Um, but it's got a lot of other features in it. And one of them is that for whatever location you're observing at, it can show you what the sky will look like during totality. Um, so I was planning to either use that or Sky Safari or Stellarium or something to create at least um, a few such diagrams for the path of totality. For the 2024 eclipse, do you recall if we're going to get a good view of the planets? That would be great. Because even if the sun is clouded over, right. there's other stuff like that we can still see. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I do remember that Venus, well, I think the west, the, the southwest part of the country is going to definitely see Venus. Well, everybody's going to definitely see Venus. And I believe the southwest part of the track, uh, they'll see Saturn too. I don't, yeah, I think Jupiter's up too, if I'm not mistaken. But I do know that Saturn sets by the time the eclipse gets uh, up to the northeast. So from New Hampshire, uh, Saturn will be like right on the horizon. Um, but from down in Texas and in Mexico, Saturn will be up pretty well too. So yeah, there's definitely going to be some planets. And as Wayne pointed out, uh, we're going to be, uh, we're likely to have a lot of great sunspots because this eclipse will be very close to solar maximum, which also means of course, that the Corona, uh, could be pretty exciting and there should be lots of prominences as well. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wayne, did you have another comment or question? Yes. Um... I am posting hydrogen alpha shots on our Facebook page for the Ascami Amateur Astronomers anytime anything interesting is happening. And we have some beautiful prominences today that I just posted. Uh, but to promote solar observing, and of course the Astronomical League now has uh, solar observing awards for you know plotting sunspots, the sun's rotation, Galileo's discovery that the sun is spinning and so can the earth be spinning and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my wife, Mary, who passed away last year, ran Draco Productions for many, many years. And she was one of the original importers of the Botter solar filters uh, for safe observing through telescopes and binoculars. And uh, so she had a bunch left over after she passed and the business was disbanded. So I just put it out there that uh, if your club might be interested in contacting astrophysics and uh, getting, uh, you can get a uh, roll of botter about a, a meter by a half meter. I think it's around 90 to $100. And I have found that for, for practically every beginner's telescope, a three inch piece of botter over the front objective or for reflectors uh, mounted off to the side axis. Even with a Celestron 8, a three inch filter will give you wonderful granulation and beautiful sunspot detail. And uh, so I'm, I'm just saying, uh, why, don't, why don't the clubs and planetariums think about getting a roll of this well in advance and let people know that they can practice for the eclipse by observing sunspots and uh, solar detail and you can make uh, the uh, filters uh, with the, the brochure that comes from BOT or Planetarium, you can reproduce it. And you can give them like a three inch BOT filter and then two one and a half inch BOT pieces that would be adequate for practically everybody's binoculars. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cost would be, you know, very minimal. I'm just doing it for free. But, uh, and if you have a new person in the club, that's getting a telescope, contact them and say, get with me if you want me to help you fit up the filter. We'll fit it over the front of your telescope, show you how to tape it for wind protection. But the more we can promote solar observing, sunspot counting, uh, solar watching in advance of the eclipse, the more proficient our whole membership will be uh, in helping people see the partial phases. And ultimately, of course, if we have the hydrogen alpha telescopes, they can be looking well in advance of totality and say, oh, wow, that prominence is going to be so cool. And then they can make a video and say, yeah, here it comes. Wow. You know, so uh, if we can promote solar observing in general with Botter and other types of uh, safe uh, over the aperture filters, uh, it's going to give us the experience cadre uh for 2023 and 2024 yep all good points okay great stuff well 
we have just a few minutes left of this session. So Rick, do you have any final closing words that you'd like to share with everybody? Uh, other than thanking everybody for their attendance at this breakout session, no, let me share my screen again for just a moment because uh, I wanna show you what is coming next. Uh, we're gonna have a break. Uh, and then after the break, we have a uh, second block, uh, which starts like the first one did with a plenary session. Uh, the topic will be formal education. Uh, and we'll have a couple of presentations, uh, one covering K to 12 and the other uh, the college level. Uh, the URL again is eclipse.aas.org slash plenary. Uh, the chair of that session will be Andrew Fracknoy. Um, and then there will be two breakout sessions that follow that uh, later in the day. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Great. Right. Well, so, any any last minute points before we wrap up? We still have three minutes left of the session. I actually would like to ask a question of the group, which is uh, whether you uh, you thought Kate was on the right track with her little subjective uh, scale of eclipse impact and eclipse excitement um, from zero to a hundred. Um, did anybody have any uh, thoughts, pro or con, or any suggestions as to uh, other things uh, that could be you know, it could be ranked to compare the experiences. Can I ask a clarifying question there? Were the, everything past the total, were those out of 10 or out of 100? They were out of 100. Okay. Yeah, the whole thing was out of 100. Okay. So everything was under 10, except in totality. And it was normalized to totality at 100. <laughs> Yeah, I would simply okay. say that a, a total solar eclipse is the most fantastic natural phenomenon you will ever see. You're not going to get any argument from me. <laughs> Preaching to the choir over here. Right. Okay, well... Looks like our hour and 20 minutes was exactly the right amount of time. So that's terrific. So I look forward to seeing you all uh, after the break um, for the formal education session. Enjoy the rest of the Thank day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.